Greetings and salutations, all you lovely individuals. We are back. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. And let me paint you a picture. The year is 2077. The latest Riot champion is connected to your brain. All you have to do is think, and it does the abilities, and Faker has picked up his 47th MVP on this pick. We're not quite there yet, but seeing him on the way today was the first step towards that journey. I'm pretty sure you need something like a, the prototype version of Neuralink to make sure you're playing something like way to the maximum effect. That was pretty much as close as we're going to get to the maximum effect from the Unkillable Demon King. Game three stuff for T1. Of course, we'll get to how we get to get game three in just a little bit here. But T1 damage control keeps the win streak going against Nongshin. Yeah, and this was kind of a classic. Felt more like a 2023 series out of T1. Because they were playing a little bit loosey-goosey, as tends to happen uh, against you know, squads like Nongshim towards the bottom. But he did play the way in that first game as well. And listen, there's no question. We've seen Caps. We've seen Humanoid. Multiple guys do ludicrous amounts of damage. The only weakness this dude has is he's so unbelievably immobile and can get caught out easily, which happened a couple times early on, but didn't really matter in this one. No, it didn't end up factoring too much, especially with the rest of T1 getting their respective jobs done in the early game, pushing into that mid game where then you start to see this way explode for T1. I think it was one of those situations where a lot of the players on Nongshim, you're seeing these abilities and you're not exactly sure what the ability is and which one it is and what the damage scaling is gonna come through. I think a lot of times caught, catching them off guard, popping them off and it continued for T1 as they're looking to cook it up a little bit for game two. Yeah, and this game, game one looked like it might have been 22 minutes. Ends up still being under 30 minutes at 28. And game two is the perfect, pixel-perfect example of your classic modern League of Legends. Because, yes, Kyria has been cooking up a storm all year. And Guma said, look, let me get in that. Let me get on that stove and try something out with the ADTF alongside Milio And an ADTF matchup versus smolder the latest champion on the rift you showed this matchup to someone from five years ago even and it, you wouldn't understand what the hell's going on like, what are you playing smite what what's going on over <laughs> here with these champions yes our first lck smolder coming across in, in this matchup and as well the twisted fate for mr gumiyushi and he was cooking something the problem was as soon as he started putting ingredients into the pot it was not meshing together you could smell that it was not going right. And, and listen, the, the rapid fire cannon plus Milio range on the gold card is all kinds of stupid when it does work. Yes, all kinds of stupid when it does work. And when it does work, it's because it got a little bit ahead early is a lot of those advantages, a lot of that power in that pick, then being able to translate that early power, early advantages and pressure it around the map. Start pushing for things with the rest of your teammates is a big part of playing that AD Twisted Fate down in that bottom lane. Never got off the runway in that type of sense for T1. You would get into these, you know, kind of 20, 30 minute team fights, and it would be all about the Udir soaking up damage for what felt like two, three whole minutes. And then here comes Smolder with all that damage, and there's the double, there's the triple kill. That was the ticket for Nongshim. And, you know, credit to Nongshim and Jiwoo in particular. They played a great game. Only T1, though. Do you have, what was it, like a 7k gold lead, a 15 kill gold lead? Uh, and that final fight where Zeus gets a nice ulti on the Yone, I was sitting there thinking, are T1 really going to win this game? I, I was hooting and hollering at that point. <laughs> and I see he gets right into that back line, gets that three-man ultimate. The damage isn't enough is the only problem at that point because it was there's no other perfect opportunity or engage at that point for T1. They get it. It's not enough damage at that point. Even you can flip it back a bit earlier into one of these fights. You have Faker living for an eternity in the side lane on oh. that karma 1v1 <laughs> against sylvie love that type of stuff going on uh overall this one felt like t1 kind of loosening on the on the straps letting go of the reins a little bit and getting a quick reminder you can't do that too much even against a squad like nongshi and then faker says yeah the karma was hilarious but let me play that way again that was a whole lot more fun and in that third game is where you fully saw it absolutely unleashed he ended up racking up 12 kills it felt like he was just 
having his pick of the litter, going from different lanes, catching guys out, TP comes in, you're under the turret, it doesn't matter. And I know myself, I can't keep up with what's going on with Huey. And it feels like a lot of these pro players, even some of his abilities still, they're like, do I have to flash this? Am I just dead? Oh, I'm dead. And it was so rapid, the lethality that came through, that damage presence of that way in this game. You know, you know around mid-game, it's relatively even. You've got some stuff on the side of Nongshim where you can feel like they can have power. They can pressure if T1 makes these mistakes. One mistake comes through from Nongshim, Way capitalizes, Baker's off to the races. He's putting that damage out all the way through. Senna, you're backing him up as well with Gumayushi, the Nocturne turning off the lights. It was picture perfect for that last half of that game three for T1, closing it out in command. And how about now a LCK leading sixth MVP for Faker. That's right, most in the league in his 11th season. And the other stat we always got to track with him, way his 81st champion that he's played professionally. Mark, there's, that's almost half the champions in the league, in the history of the game. It's one of those things where we talk about so many other players are they're expanding, adding things to the champion pool. Faker's champion pool is the champion list. That that is that's it. That's the extent of what you're getting here and what you can rely on him being able to deliver for you. Way gets added to that list. You bring it on in, looking calm, cool, collected in the mid lane from our veteran. We love to see these type of things from him, and this is the year that you would have expected. Maybe it's going to be all about Zeus. Maybe it's all going to be about Guma and Kyria, what they're cooking up in the bottom lane. And hell, Owner was fantastic at the World Championship. But it has continued with our mainstay, our main character in League of Legends, Faker. Aiden won starting out for T1, but quick shout out because there was a lot of life shown from Nongshim across this entire series. Maybe there's some hope they can crawl out of that bottom three. Yeah, I think this was certainly a better showing from Nongshim, all things considered. You, you have a little bit of loosey-goosey from T1 thrown in there, but even understanding that and seeing that, you have enough positives from this Nongshim side. I just said Jiwoo down in the bottom lane. That's where I'm looking, really, to build off of that performance for him. The actual marquee matchup on the day in the LCK was Hanwa versus KT battling for that firm third place in Korea, both sitting at 6-2, and two. and let me tell you, this first game absolutely delivered. We get a follow-up with another Smolder on the Rift. This time it's Deft, and we get to see him piloting it up to 55 minutes. This new infinite scaling should be Little Dragon, uh, and it ends up being not... I, I don't want to say not impactful, because he did insane damage throughout this game, but... Hanwha Life, time and time again, find an angle to get to death before he can take over a team fight. Yeah, it, it's one of those situations, one of those stories where you can see that damage, that threat from the smolder. It was a real deal when it was able to get that opportunity. The problem is a player like Zekka turning back the clock to the 2022 World Championship form that he has had, that is going to be a dangerous combo on a champion like Yone. You know, we just talked about Zeus getting that, you know, away from way behind ultimate in that looked so great. Every single time Yone was going in in this game, it looked fantastic from Hanwha Life. The damage was instantly there. The damage charts at the end of the game were absolutely nutty because both Deft and Viper were <laughs> like more than the rest of their team combined. But is there a bigger mismatch in terms of scaling when you've got a Lethality Varus matching up against this new Smolder pick and it's Viper coming out on top? It's crazy because, you know, for the last 20 minutes of this game, you're watching and you are feeling that difference in that scaling. Sure, there is still the serious power on the side of Averis that gets, you know, all the way through, but it is one of those ones that wanes as the game does extend into those points against a champion like Smolder, who is primed for those games that are just going to hang on, linger around until you get to those later ones. Unfortunately, not able to get that all crucial team fight, the right positioning at the right time for Def Game 1 goes the way of Hanwha life. Yeah, and I think a big thing to note, well, number one, uh, Rakan, Delight, ends up stealing that last Elder Dragon. And I think that's the third Elder Dragon of the game. One of his autos hits Deft before this fight starts, and it does like 30% of his health. Yeah, it, it's crucial at that point to be able to to keep track of those things. And this player like Rakan on the Delight, we know this champion, we know his comfort on it and how special he is. 
that type of difference is one of those things you can't be letting going over. And unfortunately for KT, oh yeah, they let that over again for game two. And it's a tale as old as time. You you lay it all on the line in that first game. 55 minutes, so mentally exhausting. And you maybe crumble a little bit heading into game two. And that is exactly what happened to KT Rolster and probably started in draft. Because you see that game one and you say, let's line up that Zeka Yone and Rakan for delight yet again. I want to run that one back. And this was a quick 5-0 start for Hanwa. It was a... Uh, KT definitely had uh, lost a bit of the sauce in that first one. Yeah, I mean, how about Jin down in the bottom lane for Viper popping off he, in this he one? He was doing damage. A... I thought it was a bug. <laughs> yeah, we're so used to him being the, the W root bot. He was absolutely the damage bot down in the bottom lane in this one. He, he, as well as you mentioned out before, getting those key picks, the Yone, the Rakan again in draft. Throw Doran on a big old meat stick like the Udyr. Easy peasy for Hanwha Life. Uh, very controlled in game two in this series. And um, Barrel never really got to play the game on this uh, Ash. No. And Zeka, I'm just going to highlight it again because this guy was 14, 1, and 17 across these two Yone games. And I think four out of the five deaths out of Barrel in this game were basically solo kills from Zeka. And if this is the type of Zeka that is going to emerge, going to keep developing with this Hanwha Life team as we move in towards that playoff crunch picture, this is going to be one of those squads you got to be concerned about heading into best of series. Because if he's playing at this type of level, this type of lethality, putting this much on his shoulders and carrying this much for the team out there on the rift with explosive champions like Yone, this is going to be a Hanwha Life team that you're going to have to deal with because we are seeing consistent enough play from the newcomers Doran peanut in that in that top jungle situation and then you look down into the bottom lane of course with viper and delight they are popping off so this is absolutely one of those squads we just talked about so much about where the you know how we're feeling about them and you know a little bit down against gen g way up with this type of bounce back against kt and this is a classic example of why it's so incredibly difficult to rank teams because you see these two squads respectively against Gen G and it's two completely different stories to talk about and then they match up head to head and it's a 2-0 over for Hanwha Life but really I think the 500 IQ play here is KT Rolster saying we just beat Gen G if we beat Hanwha got a whole lot of momentum heading to that telecom war matchup against T1 kill the excitement before that matchup Smart play, guys. Well done. Yeah, we can't have the brakes fail on us if we stop the train all before <laughs> we get to that uh, critical point of speed is the way KT Rolster take this one. Of course, they would love to have won this one against Hanwha Life is the full thing. But yes, looking at that one does pump the community brakes just a little bit, just enough, I think, to ease off the expectations heading into a very big, don't make any mistake about that, very big Telecom War matchup heading this weekend. And, you know, truthfully, if it's even just a competitive series and KT doesn't come away with it, if they're able to pick up a win, you're still going to be feeling incredibly good about KT. It feels really like the top four, the gap is only widening between the rest of the teams in the league. It's hard because we saw so varying levels of play in that T1 series. But overall, you want to see T1 maybe be a little bit sharper, a little bit more there all throughout this series. And if they're there at that type of level and KT can hang with them, can cause some damage, trade some punches, I'll be happy with that one overall. And, you know, T1, sometimes at their very best is when they're having fun, maybe throwing a game here or there, and then they completely flip it, turn it around for the next game, which is what we saw in this Nongshim series. A little bit of LPL action and maybe a team that's, they're not going under the radar, but not getting the respect that is deserved is top esports. Case and point, look in the top lane. Today, Mr. 369, there wasn't even an inkling of a three or a six. It was all nines today, a couple of Aatrox games. My man, how do you turn a 1v3 dive into a pair of solo kills, huh? You're just that good is the way that you're able to turn around something like that. It's crazy that we have gone through all this stuff, all this conversation. And, you know, it's been a little bit light, of course, with the Lunar New Year break, but everything with the LPL and 369 on top esports has gone under the radar, which is bonkers to me because it was such an immediate 
upgrade for the squad and one of the best options in the LPL for your top lane. And we see it here in this matchup, this series. He was a giga beast on, of course, a giga broken champion like a Yeah, and somehow we got it in game two as well, but uh, he picked up double MVPs. He had 12 kills in these two games. RNG as a team had 11. <laughs> a whole oh, team. Oh no. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a bit of a diffy up in the top lane, my man. He making that change happen for the squad. And you look at the rest of top esports, how they're able to play around that type of power that 369 has been able to bring in. Uh, Tian as well, looking at his job that he's done. Jackie Love, of course, always checking in with our favorite Hyper ADC. But it's also got to be time to look into the mid lane with Cream and what he's done in this type of role. Talked a lot about the expectations, pressure on him moving into this role, moving up in the ladder on where you should be contributing in the LPL. He's been right there all the way alongside this top esports team's job. Stay at this top picture in the LPL. It feels like he's still, you know, finding his footing on this team. Uh, we've seen a couple different picks, uh, not struggle on, but not be at the same level that we've seen out of OMG. Once he reaches that full potential that we felt like he's had for a couple of years, I mean, there's no reason top esports can't be legit contenders, especially when you combine 2023 Mako. We were saying it's time to retire. This guy looks completely washed up. He has bounced back in such a big way alongside Jackie Love. And now you're talking about the best support pairing in this form that Jackie Love's probably ever had. Man, you look at the strategy, the veteran status and knowledge that he brings into this team as well has been a major factor, I think, is something that we can attribute to him. Of course, a, a, a very valuable addition to the team. And as you mentioned, you know, talking about Cream, we've seen, you know, maybe above average, good, not quite at that star level performance where we know he was able to contribute or at least show that signs of with OMG. It's all about getting to that star level and pushing towards superstar status, I think is going to be the one thing to take this uh, top esports team all the way to the top of how we're talking about LPL squads. And, you know, 369 was the star today, and that's the reason I'm most excited about this squad. It feels like it's the first time in his career where it, on JDG and top esports have passed, it was like, yeah, 369 is great. He's kind of the, the third guy on the team. It feels like now he's more of the focal point is going to have more opportunities to be the featured guy to play carries and really be a leader for this team. And I can't wait to see it develop. It's been fantastic. And it has the biggest thing for me, not only is obviously the, the play that he is able to bring to this team and how fantastic he is, but it's been the stability that he has brought to that role, right? We've had instability in that top lane role. We've swapped around Wayward, Ching Tang for to top esports and their varying levels of performance and champion pools individually. You throw someone like 369 in there and he has been not only steady, he has been stellar up there in the top side. You know who else was stellar today was Mr. Light in the bot lane for Weibo Gaming. He goes deathless. We're not going to get too excited because it was against Ultra Prime who was right near the bottom of the standings in the LPL. But Weibo's been a very difficult team to grade early on in this LPL season. Now they're sitting at 4-2 and two, uh, after a 2-0 against Ultra Prime. They had to do quite a quite a comeback, especially in that second game. I think they were down about uh, 5K. But light, immaculate performances in both games highlighted by a pentakill in that second one. Oh, we love to see them pentakills, of course. But yes, light popping off for Weibo Gaming is going to be a necessary sign that we got to check off when we're checking in on the LPL and these squads and how they're doing. Because, of course, we knew so much about last year, talking about the shy for the team, talking about even Xiaohu and what he's doing. But you can't forget that the consistent damage threat that light was last year and sometimes the engine that drove things in these matches for a team like Weibo Gaming can't underestimate that type of power seeing that in this series yes even against a squad like Ultra Prime you're feeling good about that type of power for this team that's why his his name light is so perfect for this squad because he is a beacon of hope in the chaos that is so often Weibo Gaming has been one of the most consistent 80 carries over the last couple of years so Weibo can still you know Xiaohu what was he, Oriana and Karma today? He's kind of taken a back seat early on. Zhao Hao, I think, has fit in seamlessly, but I'm not ready to call Weibo a legit contender yet. 
No, we need to see a little bit more sharpness from the team, I think, is going to be it. That lethality, just that that edge that you feel like this team can carry into a match. You're not quite there yet with them compared to some of the very elite of the LPL. They're getting close. That's the scary thing, I think, for a couple of these squads is looking at a team like this in the rearview mirror and seeing what they're capable of. Because someone like Shahu, we've not really seen push it to that full length that we know that in over the course of his career that he's capable of. But especially with this Weibo gaming lineup, what he's capable of and how he can take over and be one of these leaders, not necessarily risen to that level so far this season. I feel like we've already forgotten three-fifths of this lineup. We're in the World Finals just last year, so still got to put the respect on this squad. Uh, Pentacle, by the way, for late, as I mentioned, we are, what, barely two months into a lot of the seasons. So far in 2024, across all regions, 29 Pentakills already. That is just the state of the... It's, it feels like almost every week you have not one but multiple Pentakills. And it's, the, it's it's crazy because you could go back last year and maybe understand it a little bit more because we were in the thick, in the midst of the Zeri meta and how she was popping off and how she was rapidly ascending the charts for the champions with the amount of pentakills under their name. We're not in that type of era right now with the game, but we certainly have got the players popping off and the damage in the game, the way things changed over the off season, especially I think with some of these mythic items and everything else, You've got that power in your hands to make it happen. It's not just 80 carries picking them up anymore. We've seen, you got Rumble getting some, Lilia in finals for Yike. It's it's almost every role someone can get a pet to kill. Well, I'm pretty sure if you ask anybody who was watching the official LEC broadcast, they don't know what you're talking yeah, I didn't about. See a pet <laughs> <laughs> I don't oh, know about yeah. that one. A little bit of nudging over there to the LEC. But yeah, we we really have been spoiled seeing all these type of champions pick up these pentakills, the different roles for it. I think it goes to, to show with some of these changes that come through in the offseason, the type of excitement that it brings into the game. Bring back drops for pentas, but they can't do that because there's too many pentakills happening around the globe that they'd be giving away too much free stuff. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.